Welcome today to our program entitled Optimizing Value of Your Dairy Beef Cross Cattle. Today we're going to spoke, focus specifically on taking care of those calves and what we need to do to raise them up and get them out healthy. We appreciate you joining us. So to get us started, my name is Heather Slusser, the Extension Marathon County Dairy and Livestock Agent. And presenting with me today are UW-Madison Division of Extension Agriculture Agents and Educators. And I'm going to introduce them in the order in which you will hear them speak. So first off, we have Sandy Stitchin, the Extension Taylor County Educator, Matthew Lippert, the Extension Clark and Wood County Educator, Ashley Olson, the Extension Vernon County Educator, Jackie McCarvel, the Extension Green County Educator, and Sarah Grochen, the Extension Outagami Educator. So during today's session, we are going to concentrate on optimizing the value of those pre-weaned or those wet calves, uh, specifically the dairy beef cross calves that are less than two weeks of age. So as Heather said, my name is Sandy Stitchin. And on this slide, you can see the bullets for the various marketing opportunities that dairy farms who are breeding beef to their cows have for those dairy beef cross calves. Opportunity means options and each option has its own potential financial return. There's an adage about not being a price taker. So not to just sell your calves to whomever who will buy them for whatever price given, but to actually market them by optimizing their value and actively searching out potential buyers who will provide a profitable rate of return on all of your calf inputs. The next buyer of the dairy beef cross calf wants to know what the calves are and what is their health status. And that what involves sharing the calf's dam and sire history, which is what was discussed during the other Zoom this morning. You can market the wet calf health status by sharing evidence of colostrum feeding and vaccination status, sharing the dam's herd vaccination protocol as well as the calf received colostrum, therefore the calf should have the maternal antibodies to the agents that were covered by your herd protocol. Calves raised for beef must be castrated and disbudded prior to weaning. It's all about marketing healthy calves with evidence of a, of a completed newborn health protocol and doing so will build your reputation and the relationship with your buyer. So one of the first indicators of future health and growth performance is to market only those calves who are fit for transport. Calves leaving the dairy must have dry navels with no evidence of navel infection and or evidence of and evidence of nasal sanitation, excuse me. They must be ambulatory and eating well as evidenced by weight gain, good body fill and shiny hair coats. Calves leaving your farm must be free of drug residues. Wisconsin has a robust Bob Veal market, so you should err on the side of safety and assume that every calf leaving the farm may be slaughtered for human consumption tomorrow. These are the baseline indicators that buyers have for indicating future health and performance. Advertising all of your added health inputs will set your calf apart from the others. I'm Matt Lippert. I'm a part of a dairy farm. We do all these things that you talked about, but sometimes I'm skeptical if we get the value from the market for those. How do, how do we convey that information so that people know that we've done all these right things? Matt, that's a great question. So you do this by making sure your calves are clearly identified. Optimizing value includes advertising your responsibility to these animals. And you do that by identifying the calves back to your farm. Various tag programs, including Equity's Green Ear Tag Program, exist for dairy beef cross calves. The tag refers to a newborn calf protocol that is used by the farm to precondition their wet calves. Now, if you were with us earlier on the first presentation, we also talked about partnering. So there is that option to sell directly to the calf raiser. 
and not to the auction barn. By doing this, you would be sharing that health information directly with that buyer or that partner. It is possible that you and the buyer may come to an agreement on the dry cow and the newborn health protocols that are to be used with the dairy beef cross calves. Hi, I'm Ashley Olson. And like Matt, in addition to being an extension agent, I am also um, a dairy farmer as well. We're going to talk a little bit about the umbilical cord because that's where it all starts. The umbilical cord is the lifeline between the cow and her fetal calf. Um, at birth, the cord is torn away from the placenta, but it remains attached internally to the liver and the circulatory system. Before the umbilical cord is completely dried out, it may allow disease-causing pathogens from the environment to enter the abdomen of the calf. I want to stress that when working with newborn calves and disinfection protocols to make sure to wear gloves and, and also use eye protection. Well, actually, uh, actually what, what can these pathogens do if they get into my calf through the umbilical cord? Good question, Matt. So these pathogens can cause a localized navel or liver infection, and they may be disseminated in the calf resulting in joint, respiratory, or even a systematic infection and possible death. So how do I tell if I've done a good job and have a healthy umbilical cord and navel? So signs of a healthy umbilical cord will include that it's shriveled up and dry and it's smaller in diameter than that of a pencil. Signs of a healthy navel, you'll see that there won't be swelling. It won't um, have any heat coming for it or be warm, hot to the touch, and also not painful when it is touched. How can we ensure that these calves maybe have a healthy navel since we're talking about it? We'll want to start with a clean maternity pen and uh, make sure that um, also the calf's pen is clean by minimizing time in the maternity pen after birth. It can help make sure that we are preventing those neonat neonatal infections. Uh, wet, dirty calf areas can foster the bacterial growth and invade that in that calf's navel or the mouth and cause that pathogen overload. We wanna disinfect the navel as soon as possible after birth. The gold standard is using a 7% iodine tincture for disinfection as well as drying. Um, there are other um, disinfectants you can use, chlorhexidine, sodium hydroxide and alcohol, but always be sure to seek veterinary advice for the proper um, concentration as well as disinfectants to use. You also would um, should monitor the navel care program used on your farm. There are many different ways to do that, um, but here I do have a calf health scoring chart that will show up. And this is a really great, simple, easy way just to um, make sure you're keeping track that the navels were dipped and um, you know, doing the score to make sure that it is healthy. And if there is a problem or it does have an infection, we can also document that information. So the goal is to have less than 1% of the calves on the farm develop a navel infection. And um, we don't want to transport calves off the farm when they are less than one week of age with wet navels. So what does the uh, one week of age have to do? Uh, why do I have to avoid that? because calves less than one week of age are extremely vulnerable to disease. And so waiting to transport them until after the umbilical cord has fallen off, which usually does occur around that seven to 10 days of age and make sure that there is no evidence of a navel infection, um, will definitely make sure that that calf will be less vulnerable to any sort of diseases. Next, we just have a short video on how to properly dip the navel of a calf. And as you can see, um, they're making sure that they're getting it completely covered using that 7% iodine tincture. And by doing that, hopefully we're preventing any sort of infection and making sure that that cord is getting dried up. The newborn dairy beef cross calf health protocol, it should be the same as those that are used by the dairy when the dairy retains its heifers. So that's all about using optimal maternity pen management and colostrum management. The goal of providing a clean single use maternity pen is to minimize the pathogen exposure to the calf, to minimize the quantity 
and the qual uh, quantity of the pathogens that that calf breathes in or ingests or drags its wet navel through. And I'm Jackie McCarville. I am also a dairy farmer in addition to being the agriculture educator. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about colostrum. By having a good colostrum protocol, we can reduce a lot of the impact for future challenges um, just by applying that, that protocol to all of these calves, including the dairy beef cross calves. Serum total protein is a reliable on-farm estimate of IgGs or immunoglobins in the blood in young calves and can be inexpensively checked either calf side or at the vet clinic using a refractometer. Numerous research studies have shown that total protein of 5.2 to 5.5 grams per deciliter indicate that calves have achieved successful passive transfer of immunity. That meaning that a serum IgG concentration greater than 10 grams per liter. However, there's also newer research um, that has shown for a successful long-term calf adult health, this level actually needs to be over 5.8. In the same way, total protein predictions or BRIC scores can be used to estimate IgG in the blood of calves using a handheld refractometer. Depending on the version of refractometer you are using, it will read either serum total protein or BRICS. A serum total protein below 5.2 and a BRICS below a 8.4 is a fail, which correlates less to less than 10 grams per uh, liter of serum IgG. Meaning these minimal thresholds will help the calf get through the immediate pre-weaning phase but higher levels are required for the calf to grow successfully into adulthood. Okay, so you covered those things about the serum and the blood, but how do I measure colostrum quality? Yep, so that's a great question. Um, good quality colostrum should have IgG concentration above 50 grams per liter. And there are several different tools that you can use to measure the quality. A colostrometer measures specific gravity and uses a color-coded scale. However, the colostrum must be at room temperature to read it, to help it read accurately. Colostrum components, um, other, colostrum components other than IgG can affect specific gravity. So it sometimes reads inaccurately. Um, we had one of these at our farm and um, it got put on top of our uh, hot water heater and the, the instrument inside is actually glass. And my husband accidentally knocked it over. So it can also very easily be broken. When it measures, a green is greater than 50 of IgG, yellow is 20 to 50, and red is less than 20. So at lower temperatures, the colostrometer overestimates IgG, and at higher temperatures, the IgG will be underestimated. Another option is a BRICS refractometer which is designed to measure the amount of soluble solids in a sample, meaning it measures all of the solids dissolved in the water, beginning with sugar, salts, proteins, acids, etc. It is not dependent on the temperature, and a BRICS value of 22 corresponds to 50 grams per liter of IgG. Therefore, a value of 22 or higher um, is a good quality sample. It is more accurate than the colostrometer, but you wanna make sure you keep it clean between samples to avoid uh, residue. So using distilled, distilled water should have a reading of zero if the instrument is, collaborated, is calibrated correctly. Uh, obstacle models are not as good at reading values due to the high fat content of colostrum and it can, it can cause a blurred band. So sometimes the digital models are better at reading. You do want one that can measure from zero to 30 or zero to 35. Okay, so I measure that stuff. What do I do if I don't have adequate quality? So um, high quality maternal colostrum is always the first, best first choice option. However, there are other options available. You can feed properly stored colostrum collected from another animal. You can also add a colostrum supplement if the colostrum supplied doesn't meet meet the 50 grams per liter of IgG. 
Um, there are also several colostrum replacers on the market that can be fed. However, keep in mind that a colostrum supplement and a colostrum replacer are not the same. The supplement is meant to be added to maternal colostrum. So calves with failure of passive transfer of immunity or FPT have a higher risk for developing disease and they shed more pathogens and they contaminate calf housing environments at higher rates than calves that did receive adequate passive immunity. During transport, FPT calves will shed pathogens in the trailers and the environments where they are offloaded, which increases the risk of infection to all the calves they contact. The stress of loading and unloading more so than the total distance traveled causes an, the increased shedding of pathogens. The USDA NOMS Dairy 2014 study found that on average, Holstein bull calves left US dairy farms at seven days of age. 93% of the reporting farms indicated that the bull calves received colostrum, but of those, one and a half percent received colostrum only by suckling the dam, whereas no operations reported suckling as the sole means of providing colostrum to their heifer calves. When bull calves were hand-fed colostrum, they received less volume and they were fed later, fed the colostrum later than heifers were on the farm. All these factors contribute to failure of passive transfer for the wet bull calf. Do similar disparages occur on your farm between your dairy bulls and retained heifers and now the beef cross calves? Survey work of Canadian dairy farms published in 2019 found that the median age of transported dairy bull calves was five days. And during that two week post-transport period, the disease and death rates that were recorded from the calves that were transported from 12 to 24 hours was 23% being treated for diarrhea, 44% being treated for bovine respiratory disease and 4% dying. The researchers concluded that the care of the farm of origin, including the quality and quantity of colostrum and the cleanliness of the housing provided and not being marketed at a low body weight, increased the calves ability to remain healthy following transport. So I have these questions um, that are on the slide here for our presenters, Matt, Jackie or Ashley, um, I was hoping you could chime in and answer these questions as our Zoom participants put their answers in the poll that Heather just launched. Do your dairy beef cross calves receive the same colostrum protocol as your retained calves? I'll, I'll start. First. Okay. Uh, yeah, we, we feed all of our calves colostrum. We think it's just good husbandry, but I do know that uh, the people feeding them see if they're a black calf, a bull calf. And uh, I, I think it mentally goes through their mind. They've been taught that, you know, heifers are the highest priority, but yes, definitely all of our calves, uh, we try to be prompt and feed them colostrum and high quality colostrum as soon as possible. And on our farm, we are also feeding um, maternal colostrum as soon as possible um, to all animals, uh, male, female, crossbred, Holstein, whatnot. Um, we are not currently monitoring the total protein in our uh, colostrum, but we have very few sick calves. So I 100% believe our colostrum program and newborn calf program is working. Um, and if we don't have enough colostrum, we are using a colostrum replacement. And, and I should have jumped in there just uh, um, we, we have the ability to monitor the protein, total protein. Uh, I think it happens more often if we think there's a problem. And we definitely do, uh, if, if we don't have colostrum available, we use a high quality colostrum replacer. We do the same at our farm, um, more so of what Jackie does is, as well. Um, we don't always uh, monitor our total proteins, but um, everyone receives colostrum regardless of um, who they are. 
And um, if we do not have enough colostrum, we do use a, a good quality colostrum replacer as well. So calves may successfully respond to oral scour vaccines and intranasal respiratory vaccines given at birth. However, prevention from infectious scour and respiratory agents for calves less than four months of age is best provided by that passive transfer of colostrum. It's really all about the colostrum. It's just so difficult to try to vaccinate the calf to protect it from its future exposures to all these pathogens that it comes into contact with. But it's a cost to the dairies. So dairies have to evaluate the benefit for utilizing vaccines in their wet calf protocol. And based on my personal conversations, many dairies do not administer the intranasal bovine respiratory disease vaccines to the calves that are not retained by their dairy because of the added expense and the risk of the pre-harvest meat withdrawal. Many of these vaccines do have a meat withdrawal. Also, it does take time for the calf's immune system to respond and immediate transport stress that gets put upon these calves right after you vaccinate them, that's gonna increase their pathogen exposure and all that stress may negate or overwhelm the immune response. If you are confident that your calves may not, are not going for Bob Veal, then I would suggest you go ahead and give the cross calves the intranasal at birth, but then wait, wait beyond 10 days to transport so that the local immune response is on board. And as we talked earlier, to make sure that that navel has fallen off. And if your calf is tagged, that provides an indication to the buyer that the calf may have been given a vaccine. For sure, you want to tell the next buyer when and what you gave so that that person can observe the meat withdrawal and booster appropriately. Or if you have a relationship with a particular buyer that you are direct marketing with, you can have discussion about who gives which product and when that product is to be given. So here's another poll question for our um, audience. Do your dairy brief cross calves receive the same vaccination protocol as the retained heifer calves? And while that poll rolls, I'm just gonna go ahead and keep talking about vaccinating. This slide explains why the young calf vaccination often fails to protect the calves. The drawing is not to scale. The, ad, the calf age is on the horizontal and the vertical axis depicts the blood concentration of antibody or immunoglobulin in the calf's immune system. The blue line depicts the waning passive transfer of, a, of the immunity from colostrum that is gone by four to five months of age. And the red, um, line with the arrow depicts the calf's maturing immune system, the calf's ability to respond to disease challenges using their own immunity. With passive, with adequate passive transfer, maternal antibody will block the vaccine response of the systemically injected vaccines, especially those vaccines that are given IM or sub-Q. And the calf is immunologically immature. It's not able to mount much of a response to those injected vaccines. Immunological maturity occurs at puberty, at 12 months of age. So early on, less than three weeks of age, it's best to give only the oral or nasals, which the calf's local immune response will respond to, but not give the systemic ones, as they're gonna be blocked by the maternal antibody and the calf's immune system responds poorly to them. I want you to take note of this crossover point here that's happening when the calf is about four to five months of age. This is occurring when backgrounded calves are entering feedlots. So there's a lot of susceptibility at this point to disease here as the maternal immunity is waning and the calf's um, immune system is not yet fully mature. Bovine respiratory disease or BRD, which may result in interstitial pneumonia causes the biggest economic impact during the backgrounding and finishing phases of beef production. One or two treatments for respiratory symptoms early in a young calf's life may indicate lung disease and may lead to reduced lung capacity, which raises the calf's susceptibility to respiratory, respiratory disease later in life. 
and the associated poor weight gain in the feedlots and ultimately reduced meat quality grades that are seen at harvest. Work with your veterinarian to develop the vaccine protocol to help calves survive their first real major challenge, especially from those viral respiratory agents that occurs three weeks immediately following shipping and commingling. So let's take a look at those poll results. And I'd like to ask Matt and Ashley and Jackie again to chime in about their dairy's newborn vaccination protocols. We do the same for all calves. Um, once they're born, um, dip their navels, we use N43 along with a bolus that they get um, for E. coli as well. And we do give it to all the calves um, just because a majority of them are staying at our farm. But if there are any leaving our farm, um, we do have that rule. You know, we try to treat them the way we would treat ones we're keeping as well. And we're the same on our farm, um, you know, giving the enforce and then that, that bolus for scours too. Um, and most of ours are either staying on the farm or my parents have now been buying um, a lot of our bull calves too. Um, and our crossbreds were going to a, a private buyer, but I anticipate my parents would start to purchase them from us too. We also use uh, Enforce 3. It sounds like a commercial here today. Um, and the coronavirus intranasal. So, uh, I mean, we just follow the uh, recommendation of our, our vets. Uh, and I don't know if anybody's been chiming in on the chat or if there's any chat responses to that. Well, the guy I buy all my dairy cross calves private, and he does not do his beef calf cross the same as his heifers as I buy them right away, wet navel, wet calves. So like he gives heifers a whole thing. My vet only has me given, uh, I don't use Enforce, I use nasal three with PMH for that instead of doing the Enforce. And he and does, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, I'm not clear. You're the dairy farmer? No, I buy calves direct from a guy, my neighbor. Okay, so when you get them, do you, then you go ahead and give the internasal that your vet recommends? Yep, yep, I give nasal three with PMH. Yeah, and it's a pretty short trip, so there isn't much transport stress? About three minutes. Yeah, perfect, because that's what they were seeing in that dairy, um, in the Canadian study especially. It's the number of trips on and off, the amount of commingling, the length of the duration of the trip is one thing, but on and off, multiple stops, really stresses those calves out. So you're running down the road for three minutes later and then giving the vaccine, you probably get a good take on it. Right, and then I, I keep quarantined for 21 days. Good job, you're working well with your vet. I appreciate that you're um, getting his input on that. Yep. Okay, I think we're gonna move on to disbudding and dehorning. Hello everyone, I'm Sarah Grochen. I am up here in Outagamie County, the dairy livestock educator. Um, so lastly today, we are going to talk about disbudding heifer and bull calves and then castrating the bulls. So I'd like to stress to always remember use pain mitigation for both disbudding and castration procedures. And two important points when disbudding are, uh, number one, some beef sires are not pulled. So purposely inspect the dairy beef cross calves for horn buds because some may and some may not have horns um, to, that are going to develop. And two, disbud as close to their day of birth as possible. Uh, now I think Heather will want to talk on a few important points on castration. So Heather. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. So the feeders prefer a surgical or a knife cut castration as opposed to banding because that helps them ensure that both testicles are gone. Where in the bending process, sometimes one can get lost up in the scrotum. The incision must be healed prior to transport 
and banded calves with the associated chronic pain caused by banding should not be transported. For dairies that are retaining ownership, those beef cross calves should be castrated using pain mitigation prior to weaning. Same as what Sarah said for disbudding, so making sure we're using that uh, pain mitigation for both processes. It is important to remember that calves should not be transported with an open or non-healed sores, either on their head from the disbudding process or on their scrotum from the castration process. So when we talk about the procedures of disbudding and dehorning, both of these procedures are bloodless compared to the high stress procedures of gouging, sawing, or cutting, which leaves an open wound and a higher risk of infection. So the difference though between uh, disbudding and dehorning is disbudding is the destruction of horn producing cells before skull attachment. This procedure is done at eight weeks or before, ideally as close to the day of birth as possible. When, and when you can feel the calf's horn butt is, is free floating, so it's gonna be wiggly and, and loose. And at this stage, the horn cells have not attached to the skull. Dehorning is the procedure done after eight weeks when the horn cells have attached to the skull. It is now considered a surgical procedure because you are actually removing the horn from the skull attachment. And at this stage, you can no longer use the caustic paste procedure, um, which you have done you know, at eight weeks or before. So the best practice is to debud or disbud your newborn calves um, while they're newborns. Uh, remember, not all crossbred calves may be pulled. So again, um, you need to feel the horn bud and then correctly apply the paste within three days of age if possible. Calves with a dry scab can be marketed off the farm. When you're applying the caustic paste, use gloved hands and apply a nickel sized amount for calves less than one week of age and a quarter size for calves older than a week, up to eight weeks. Older than eight weeks, you can no longer use the paste procedure. So all methods of disbudding and dehorning cause pain and pain management is expected in today's management practices. Farm Animal Care 4.0 is the latest version of standards used by producers addressing animal care. Current Farm Point O states, pain mitigation for disbudding is provided. So producers are encouraged to work with their local vet to determine the most appropriate individualized pain management protocol for their operation. A veterinarian client patient relationship needs to be in place for prescription local anesthetics which includes the drugs lidocaine and meloxicam. The veterinarian will teach you the proper placement and dosage for all pain mitigation techniques and drugs. And the veterinarian will assign an adequate withdrawal time for each drug as well. Pain management focuses on two main areas of concern, which are important when raising cattle. And these are animal well being and the safety of the animals and all the farm workers. So this slide lists the supplies needed for applying caustic paste. Uh, you should always remember to store the supplies in a warm room so nothing freezes and gather all the supplies before starting any procedure. If you get paste on your skin, use vinegar to wash it off because vinegar neutralizes the paste and stops the, the burning. Remember that the paste does not wash off with water. Use Vaseline to surround the paste on the, on the horn cells to keep the paste on the horn bud. Try not to get the paste on the calf's skin near the ear or the eye as the paste will cause burning in that area. Sarah, you, you mentioned what I do if I get uh, the caustic paste on myself. Can I do those same things, use the vinegar on the, for the calf? I mean, they're wiggling around. Oh, definitely. That is what you want to use, Matt, because that um, it does not come off with water, so use the vinegar on the calf as well to stop the burning in areas that uh, you do not want, you know, like if it's close to the eye or the ear or someplace like that. So definitely vinegar is the way to go. 
Okay, and finally, uh, to achieve the best outcome for both the animal handlers, the procedures uh, or producers should train and retrain employees on the standard operating procedures, review and update the procedures periodically, aim for a consistent procedure and handling the calf only once if you can, ensure that all workers know what supplies are needed and include when to do the disbudding procedure and the steps to follow. On the standard operating procedures, you can show pictures of proper uh, techniques and definitely include a plan B if a calf is ac accidentally skipped so that uh, the workers know uh, what to do at that point. So I think at this point, Sandy uh, will ask Matt, Ashley and Jackie uh, a question about disbudding on their farms. I'm actually very curious, are you, um, are you, Disbudding them, or are you just using pole genetics? So I'm going to talk about our Holsteins and Jerseys first. Um, we're doing a really good job of uh, getting them disbudded very early, and I think that sometimes we have some polled calves that get disbudded anyhow because it gets a little harder to tell when you're doing that really early. But obviously most of those cross calves are pulled, but they may not all be. So just telling you the way it happens in our farm is I think sometimes we're disbudding some with pace that don't need the procedure. And on our farm, our crossbreds um, always seem to have been pulled. So we have done nothing with them. With our Holsteins, we are disbudding them early um, within the first few weeks, but we are using um, a hot iron. And on our farm, we've been um, actually with our dairy, um, our Holsteins and jerseys using pulled um, sires for quite a while. So I'm gonna knock on wood. Um, at this time, about 90% of our calves are pulled. If they are not pulled, we do um, caustic paste them if we can. Um, but sometimes again, it's hard to tell that early on if they're, if they're gonna be pulled or not. So some end up getting paste that, that are pulled as well. Um, if it does need to go further than that, if we miss one, um, then we will hot iron as well. So I've been asked to talk with you guys about castrating these beef dairy crossbred calves. And to be honest, I'd skip it. <laughs> I, I don't get it, Heather. I mean, you just went through all these protocols and uh, we're supposed to deliver a castrated calf at uh, uh, some point. So, uh, and we're supposed to do this fairly young to be uh, less invasive. So why are you say, making it that we just skip this procedure? <laughs> So I guess my answer is a little facetious, Matt, because you do want to castrate them, right? It is important to castrate these calves. However, as we said, you don't want to ship them with an open wound. And if we're going to be shipping them a long distance, we're going to be putting them under stress. So the stress of, stress of castration on top of the stress of shipping sets them up for failure. So we really want to make sure that if we are going to castrate them, that we're retaining them on the farm long enough for that wound to heal before we ship them on to their next destination, excuse me, their next destination. So the QR code that's provided here is a link to a fact sheet on the various castration methods that are available for owners to use. Um, we've also uh, dropped that in the chat for you guys so you can see a direct link to that fact sheet as well. So Matt and everyone out there, not that you shouldn't ever castrate your animals, but if you're going to be shipping them within the first five days of life or within a period of time before that wound can heal, please don't go through the process of castrating them. And if you are gonna retain them on your farm to, to feed or finish, then you do wanna castrate while they're still on milk before they're weaned. Exactly. Again, early is, early is better. All right, so at this time, we'd like to thank everyone for attending, for your attention today. If uh, you guys have any questions, we'd please appreciate you putting those in to the chat box for us. 
Also, if you have any comments, concerns of different topics that you would like to see in the future, please drop those in the chat box for us as well. So we can go ahead and create a program that will be beneficial to you. We, we do have a chat question. Great. Do you right, want to so, read it? I can't see it. Yeah. So the question is, you touched on colostrum. What about milk feeding protocols? And then is there an impact and ROI or return on investment on high milk feeding quantities? Um, I'll take a stab at answering this first. When it comes to these beef cross calves, you are now raising an, a beef animal. Um, the ultimate goal for that animal is to be harvested and it's all about feeding I heard a quote in the earlier um, presentation this morning, uh, he, feeding hard, fast, and while they're still young. So um, there's some new research coming out in the dairy world with the straight dairy heifers that the farm's retaining that we still may be underfeeding them and not feeding enough. Um, and I think this may still be happening with the cross calves as well. They need to be on you gotta think about raising these calves as if they were suckling their mama, where it would be ad libitum feeding, the calf gets to eat whenever they want, so that they are doing over a pound of average daily gain, more like a one and a half pound that they are gaining from day one. Does that answer the question? I think there was some discussion in this morning. I don't know how many people were on from this morning, but there was this question, can a dairy farmer or a calf ranch, can they do as good as a beef cow at raising these calves? We're kind of redefining the, uh, the beef system here because we're doing a lot more animals that are being raised by people. But Sandy, uh, I, I think you hinted these animals are programmed to, uh, to grow fast and so they would uh, want a lot of a uh, lot of milk and more frequently than the so the question wasn't how often but amounts so if you're doing amounts you might be doing the three times a day feeding uh, and looking at 10 percent of their body weight and remembering that they're going to grow so you need to probably invest in a scale and actually measure them so you can continue to adjust up the amount that you're giving um, so you just don't stay at 10% forever, but you continue to increase the offering. I think it's going to take a little bit of tweaking and rethinking about how you feed calves, these beef cross calves. They may be not quite the same. I actually think we're going to end up rethinking how we're feeding our heifer, straight heifer dairy calves as well. Are there any other questions or did I not cover that correctly to the person who asked it? Uh, so, there's a question in there yet. Yep. So follow-up question. Will they eat 15 to 20% of body weight like heifer Holsteins? The straight beef calves can, uh, the research I've seen, yes, they, when they're suckling mama, they can go up to over 10 to 12%. So it stands to reason if the whole straight Holstein can and the straight beef can that the cross can as well. So the question uh, earlier on the economics of this, um, I mean, I'm thinking uh, Greg uh, realizes there's a, probably a debate there in dairy heifer replacements as well. And, and I would argue it, it's, uh, you, you know, there's probably a little more management or at least different management involved if you're pushing these calves, feeding them faster, more. Um, they're gonna look like they're scouring more. Um, you're raising the solids. Uh, so I think it would depend a little bit on how successful you are at that higher milk feeding program. You know, and, and it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be a good return on investment if uh, if you have some calf performance issues associated with working harder. Um, 
And then how much are you paying for the milk or the milk replacer? In right. my in my neck of the woods, a lot of the co-ops have some excellent calf raising um, nutritionists on hand who can help with this uh, to actually think about and work through how, what percent salad you need, um, how to mix correctly. I would really stress that you take advantage of these specialists and help them to continue to tweak and fine tune your feeding procedures. So Ryan, I think he's implied that uh, we should be able to feed them milk like a dairy heifer because Ryan chatted that as far as uh, starter quality and intake levels that we might, well, his chat was we need more beef and dairy specific research, but current thinking is a program similar to replacement heifers can work until around 400 pounds. And I think that's important because a lot of dairy producers, if they were raising their calves, might want to be raising these animals together with their, with their dairy beef animals as well. All right, so we do have a couple of other questions as well. So one is uh, kind of in line with the feeding question. So wouldn't the producer be wise to compare milk replacer costs versus using the farm sellable milk, depending on component levels and price per hundredweight? Consistency of milk being fed has to come into play too, I would think. Well, again, there's farmers that are doing very, dairy producers, calf raisers that are doing very well with pasteurized milk. And uh, there's people that are happy with the uh, milk replacer programs. So I think they both can be viable, but certainly we're feeding more on average. When, when uh, Sandy was quoting uh, what's, you know, the NOM surveys and stuff like that, I'm, I'm sure in the country we're feeding on average more solids to a calf today than we did a decade ago. Some calves are being fed the same, but more people are putting more into those calves than they once did. Sandy, did you want to add or? Did he say saleable milk? So he's taking bulk tank milk and? Yes, that's what the okay. question is saying. Yeah, and I, I do know dairy farms that do that. Um, the only thing, uh, the veterinarian side of me from my previous life as, life as a veterinarian, I caution on using saleable milk. If it's not pasteurized, you start to think about what else am I giving these calves? Is there yonis on the farm? Am I now feeding yonis to these new calves? Which in a beef cross calf world, yonis is not a huge thing. I don't think it's a huge thing, but usually these calves are harvested for meat long before the yonis ever shows up. But thinking about that, what's in the non-saleable milk that you could be infecting your calves with? Sandy, do you have any opinions on what they call transition milk? So it's really no longer colostrum, but it's, uh, it maybe has some Ig levels in it or not. Uh, do you have an opinion on how to manage that? Uh, feed it. Um, and there was just some recent articles out that I was reading about the importance of transition cow milk. Um, yes, it doesn't have the, okay, transition is right after she's gone ahead and freshened. The first milk at calving is the colostrum where all the immunoglobulin is, but our dairy cows are ramped up to come into milk. So they start making milk the minute they go into labor pretty much. So they start to dilute out the colostrum that's in their udder and it, it creates this milk that you know it's too thick, it doesn't look good enough to be able to be sold for human consumption. But that milk has value. Um, and I've seen reports where the uh, dairy are being counseled to collect it separately and continue to feed it. Um, because there is a little bit of immunoglobulin in it, but more importantly, it has this extra fat and other um, growth hormones and insulin factors that are in from mom that's being put in. And 
that transition milk will continue to bathe the local gut and the local intestine and help protect and give some local protection to the gut for these calves so they don't, they don't get sick. So yeah, I, it's great. And uh, the only other thought with transition milk is some people think uh, treated cow milk is, might be mixed into this and that's a different category of milk, acidic milk that's treated, that's a different inventory of milk versus transition cow, cow milk off the fresh cows. Are you saying those antibiotics that might be in that treated milk of, is problematic if, if we're marketing those calves pretty quickly or what are you saying there? Um, yes, because even if you pasteurize it, the antibiotic residue is not killed by pasteurization. Mm -hmm. And if you're selling to a wet calf market that anybody could buy and turn into Bob Veal the next day they own it, there's a potential of having a meat weather residue there. So you gotta be careful of that if there's any antibiotic residue. Same can be said with your dry cow therapy on your fresh cow colostrum or the transition cow. What dry cow product did you use? How long of a withdrawal is in it? Did that cow freshen early? So there's a potential, so there's a residue left from the dry cow. You gotta pay attention to that when we're dealing with the Bob Veal market and potential residues. All right, so there is one more question in the chat. At what age are the dairy beef crossbred calves typically being weaned? I think they're being weaned like uh, we wean our dairy re replacement heifers. In ours, we wean at the same age, at two months when we wean our regular Holstein cattle. It would still be about right starter consumption. Right. And, yeah. and trying to get, you know, double that birth weight and all of that. Um, but a lot of it's got to do with how much starter they're eating. Right. And I've seen some recent articles lately about extending, uh, delaying weaning. Instead of eight weeks, maybe we should be thinking about 12 weeks. Um, just to make sure that they've got really good growth on them. If you think about the cow calf world, those um, straight beef calves are on mama for five to six months before they wean. Although there are some beef operations that are weaning early at four months, beef operations tend to not wean at eight weeks. So it's something to explore and, and continue to read and pay attention to the articles that come out in your agricultural presses and talk with your veterinarian about Again, it's a cost. If you're going to be feeding milk replacer, I understand that. But going longer with the overlap, you may end up with a more growth put on those calves, and they actually do better in the long run. Well, so I'd like to ask Ashley. Uh, she has jerseys, but uh, I was last month. I got over twenty-four dollars hundred weight on my milk, so I'm going to be pretty hesitant to uh, prolong. You know, I, I'm pretty happy to feed more expensive milk replacer, um, feed them more to get them going. But, you know, if it's a gray area that they can do as well on starter or eventually starter and hay, um, <laughs> you know, that milk's pretty valuable right now. Yeah. And um, so we, we actually, um, just to be straight up and honest, we feed whole milk at our farm to our calves. We do test the milk that does get fed to the calves so we know what the components are. Um, it, it does come from, from the same cows, but um, as you are alluding to, Matt, we do have calves that um, are bull calves and some others that do get milk replacer just for the fact that with the price of milk and yeah, having jerseys in our herd, pretty high components. Um, we were over 25 the end of last month. And yeah, when the milk is valuable, depending how many calves we have, we do, we do weigh out that cost on the farm. We probably should look at it more than what we do, um, but that's just what we do personally at our farm. Nick, do you have another question? 
<laughs> yeah. What's your guys' input on feeding hay? Now, I do have a scour issue from time to time. My vet's got me feeding hay, and my brother-in-law told me it's just a scratch factor. Do you guys think that's good or bad? At what age? Are, are you talking like less than two months, or what age yep. are you talking hay? Yeah, I got calves that, I got beef calves that'll chew on it at two days old. Me, currently, I'm not feeding hay until they're weaned. Okay. I'm just getting grain and um, grain and milk and water. Matt right. Yeah. I, I, I didn't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, I don't know. I just noticed when I throw it in, they start chewing on it about right away. So you think that's uh, different with a, a, a dairy beef cross? Because it definitely would not be uh, our normal recommendation on a, a dairy calf. And I'm thinking uh, um, following the the comments in here that we're treating them pretty pretty similarly when they're still wet calves. I mean, your uh, your rumen development is much better uh, with the uh, uh, acids that are developed off of the starter than uh, your acetic acid that you'd be uh, trying to produce off of some hay. So you're going to really get them much quicker started on on dry feed if you keep that. You know, if it's just really minimal, I, I don't think you're going to have a huge problem, but you, you don't want it in any way to hinder how much starter that they're actually going to get. Right. I know like the ones that I have that are, well, the groups that I've already sold, they do consume. I feed a pellet. I feed a whole group. I feed a complete feed pellet. They do seem to start on that faster. I don't know what it is, what they do have a little bit of hay. So I don't know. I just wonder what input was on it. They're still a bovine, regardless of right. what cross they are. So right. they do not have a rumen right. at less than two weeks of age. So they're chewing on things because they're chewing on things. Right. Uh, it right. might even be a little bit of boredom. It might be because they're hungry and maybe your milk product, milk feeding isn't meeting their need needs okay yeah so All right. do I, you guys have a i've been doing this for a while but what's what does uw extensions i feed i went from a 24 24 down to a 20 20 because 24 24 was way too powerful is there a recommendation for milk replacement that we should be feeding these calves those both can work um, I was trying to allude to that before that, um, um, I mean, at one time there was no 24, 24 around, right? There was 2020s, 2010s, and we, we went kind of decades feeding calves that way. And it was like least cost. Yep. And, um, we've moved to higher. We, you know, we weren't doing many three times a day feeding. Uh, we weren't, we didn't have these higher, I'm going to call them accelerated products. Um, you, you know, I, I think uh, we were also in a animal well-being conference uh, uh, a couple weeks ago. Even how humane is it to have these calves nearly, I mean, really limit fed uh, on this traditional program that we used to have. So, um, um, again, it's, it's how well you can do, how happy your calves are, but, uh, um, obviously it costs more. And I think it's kind of a close trade-off why we are going around and around this issue that, that, uh, they may gain enough to readily justify it. And a dairy farmer is looking at it, you know, there was early things on those higher quality products that they saw perform, you know, you did it to them for the first month of life and then you saw a performance difference on the first lactation as a two-year-old well this is a little bit different in these dairy beef cross calves you know are you gonna what are you measuring it against but certainly uh really starting a calf out well which might include um more solids from a milk replacer program has benefits for immune immune system development and and so uh <laughs> I think you can do either way, but there's there certainly are reasons to consider the higher solids. Okay. You said you can do both. 
And, and yeah, of I, course, I expect both, yeah. And of course, making sure that the milk replacer is milk based, right? Yeah. Good quality, yeah. high, high quality protein. protein. Yeah. And uh, okay. Heather shared the uh, Penn State uh, spreadsheet where you can, I'm sure you're gonna have to put in your own numbers because I think different people might get different answers, but comparing about using your own milk versus purchase milk replacer, that there's a spreadsheet there that you can kind of go through that rubric and, and figure that out uh, what makes most sense for, for your operation. And, and I do think just to add real quick, I know we're, we're talking a lot about this, but um, you know, it really depends. Um, you know, we, we don't feed hay till they're weaned, but we do, when we do feed a milk replacer, I do feed a Jersey blend mix just so I get that, um, higher protein and fat. And you do really have to watch the calves, you know, watch for scouring, but then, you know, is it really scours or are they just loose because we're, we're feeding them that higher protein and fat. And, um, depending on the bull calves or, or the dairy, um, beef cross calves we have, they, they sometimes get that too. Yeah. Thank you everyone for attending today. Um, Sandy took the slides down, but I think you've probably had it up there long enough where everybody could see that our last program in this series is on March 22nd. If you have not registered for that, the link to register is in the chat. You can do that at the livestock.extension.wis.edu backslash events web URL. Uh, we appreciate you all for being here and look forward to seeing you guys again on the 22nd. So thank you.